um, I will uh, discuss a systemic therapy, but not so much the systemic therapy options we have in recurrent glioblastoma, but I will uh, try to discuss a little bit whether and which molecular markers uh, to incorporate or what we know about molecular markers and, and how they may be useful or may not be useful in, in recurrent glioblastoma. I want to highlight that um, we, had, uh, we, we have published recently uh, an update on the EANO guidelines that have already been mentioned uh, before because uh, several new uh, trials uh, came out, uh, for example, on immunotherapies, but especially also uh, new informations on, uh, on, on molecular uh, profiling, molecular um, classifications in, in gliomas have become uh, available. Um, and um, you can see in this chart here, and this focuses uh, on, um, on uh, diagnostically relevant molecular markers, that um, our classification of gliomas is becoming more and more so sophisticated and uh, we have left the days behind where we only looked into the microscope to define which type of glioma we are dealing with. But uh, nowadays we need um, several molecular markers like IDH and ATRX and, and uh, TERT and other, other things uh, that you can see here to classify uh, gliomas. Um, the topic for today is However, not so much how to diagnose uh, the types of gliomas, but which molecular markers might be useful for, um, for guiding our treatment decisions. So um, I would like to discuss more what we know about predictive markers in recurrent glioblastoma. We are all very aware that um, MGMT promoter methylation is um, to some extent a predictive marker in, uh, in newly diagnosed disease. And you can see here, uh, uh, a chart again from, from our EANO guidelines, uh, which uh, shows um, some, um, some considerations uh, on how to decide on, on, on treatments in, in newly diagnosed uh, in, the, in, the, in the top and at progression here on the bottom. In newly diagnosed disease, as I said, we are all probably aware that MGMT promoter methylation, especially in elderly patients, may help us to define treatments. However, if we go here to progressive disease, we find here um, some treatments options, and some of them have been uh, discussed in detail now, like uh, repeat surgery, like uh, re-irradiation, and some drug therapy options, including alkylating chemotherapies, uh, VGF inhibition, and of course experimental therapy if uh, if available. However, we however uh, we note that here no molecular markers um, are highlighted uh, in, in in this uh, guideline flowchart. I would like to um, get your op opinion, and um, I'm, I'm very interested to see um, your um, your poll results here. Elizabeth, I would like you to, 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 to start the poll. The simple question, do you rut routinely use MGMT testing for clinical decision-making in recurring glioblastoma? So this question is specifically on recurring glioblastoma and not on newly diagnosed. Ah, yes, now I see. No, 100% no. Okay, why is that the case? Um, it's kind of astonishing to to know that uh, in, in newly diagnosed glioblastoma we um, we use MGMT um, at least in elderly patients uh, with some confidence uh, to 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 guide treatment decisions, and in recurrent setting we are much less confident. Why is that the case? Um, um, First of all, it was noted that MGMT status is relatively stable if you compare null diagnostic disease to recurrent glioblastoma. So in about 90% of the cases, MGMT promoter methylation status is retained. So um, why not uh, use this uh, marker also for, for therapy decisions uh, in the recurrent setting? And here we come to some trials that give us, give us some information on this uh, topic. One was uh, mentioned in the discussion uh, just, uh, just previously the director trial where two dose dense um, temozolomide um, regimens were compared in recurrent glioblastoma uh, and there was uh, there was no difference between these uh, treatments arms but what was also looked at was uh, um, how MGMT promoter methylation status associated with patient outcome and here um, MGMT promoter methylated patients uh, did better than unmethylated of course this trial, um, so, give, so these results give some indication, of course, that MGMT promoter methylation may be a predictive value, but they do not prove it because all the patients uh, received temozolomide and simply their study design 
does not allow the conclusion on a, uh, whether this is uh, predictive or not. But it has been used in the past uh, as an argument in favor of using NGMT testing in, uh, in, in the recurrent setting. But there are other trials where, where you can look into the data and find, find some uh, information. Uh, for example, the rescue study, again, uh, a trial on those intense temozolomide and recurrent malignant glioma. Um, um, again, um, so here, not different dose, um, dose, dose in regimens were compared, but just uh, uh, three different cohorts were defined um, uh, with regard to when the recurrence um, uh, took place. Um, but what I want to highlight here that again it, uh, it was looked at methylation and GMT methylation status and uh, as a small but uh, but still a prognostic uh, impact was seen but again unfortunately no uh, conclusions can be can be made on on any predictive value but um, the difference between MGMT methylated and unmethylated was relatively small and the, the patient uh, numbers were also uh, small so again no clear indication that MGMT um, uh, should, is, is, is useful as predictive marker. Quite interesting, an Italian study, um, other egg trial uh, comparing um, potemustine and uh, bevacizumab in patients with a recurrent glioblastoma. Here we see um, in this potemustine uh, treated patients that those patients with MGMT methylated uh, tumors uh, did uh, uh, substantially better than those with MGMT unmethylated status. You see uh, 5.9 versus uh, six months, uh, 16 months median overall survival time, while in the bevacizumab treated patients there was no uh, uh, difference. So this uh, is, is a data point uh, or information that points in the direction of uh, MGMT being predictive uh, in, in the recurrent setting. Um, and other trials show different results, so it becomes more and more complicated the more you look. If you look at the BELOP trial, uh, a trial comparing again in recurrent uh, glioblastoma, bevacizumab uh, versus chemotherapy, but this time not fotimustine, but uh, CCNU, so uh, lomastin. And here it gets a little bit confusing because here the, the bevacizumab uh, uh, arm uh, shows the difference in favor of the, the MGMT methylated patients while this was uh, not seen or seen in, to a much lesser extent in the CCNU uh, treated patients. Um, we can also look at other uh, trials since uh, we brought up uh, Lomastin and, and here uh, the Regoma trial is a, is a good example which uh, compared uh, Regorafenib um, with again Lomastin as, as the control arm and here, um, no, uh, no, no uh, indication of uh, MGMT being predictive for for um, for uh, benefit of chemotherapy was seen. Uh, and just uh, for completeness, uh, 26 101 can also be looked at if, if you dig deep into the supplemental uh, tables. But again, here the study design uh, is not really uh, helpful uh, in answering the question whether MGMT is. Uh, is predictive here or not because uh, CCNU was uh, used in, in, in both treatment arms. So overall, um, I agree with uh, with the poll results that uh, MGMT testing uh, is at this point not uh, not uh, not reasonable in in the in the recurrent setting. And I find it astonishing that we don't have clear data on that question because uh, we all uh, see recurrent glioblastoma patients on an everyday basis. So it's one of our the main tumor types uh, we treat and all patients with uh, glioblastoma relapse and we, and we have to make uh, decisions uh, and we don't even have uh, clear data on this topic. So I think here we need to uh, make a better job in, in designing uh, studies to, to answer that question. However, it brings us to uh, another question, and that is, do you routinely use molecular profiling? And, and here I mean looking for um, uh, target mutations or so uh, for, for, for uh, precision medicine in recurrent glioblastoma. Again, simple, yes or no. 42% okay. of you uh, think or do it, so uh, use molecular profiling, while 58% don't. I find this very interesting. Uh, and let's uh, see what we can uh, what we can uh, find in the literature about this here. Um, we performed a, a, a review recently, which uh, where we looked at molecular targeted therapy of uh, glioblastoma. I'm losing my 
presentation. And uh, in this, um, we have a table here of potential molecular uh, targets for glioblastoma, IDH wild type uh, uh, glioblastoma. And you see a list of, of, of uh, molecular targets that in principle may be amenable to some uh, uh, targeted treatment. However, as, as we saw before, in the algorithm on, on the treatment of recurrent glioblastoma, our guidelines do not um, recommend a, a specific targeted treatment at this point. Although there are some targets that may be uh, useful. Um, for example, and you can see here that in this uh, paper, BRAF uh, mutations were found in, in some glioblastomas, unfortunately, however, at a very low rate of about uh, 2% of the cases. And since this is an alteration that is um, uh, that is used in, in, in other fields of oncology, uh, specifically in, in, in melanoma, but also some other tumor types uh, as, a, as, a, as a successful treatment target, the question arises whether this is uh, useful in glioma too. I want to uh, point out that some types of glioblastomas, uh, so-called epithelioid glioblastomas, show a particularly high percentage of about 50% of BRAF uh, mutations, uh, so that is something uh, to keep in mind. Not too many data are available, unfortunately, about the, the value of uh, BRAF inhibition in BRAF mutated uh, glioma, but there are some, like this recent paper here, where in a basket study, uh, gliomas uh, harboring this uh, mutation were treated with a, a BRAF inhibitor called lemurafenib. Um, you can see here that uh, the sample sizes were not too large. However, again, it's a it's a rare mutation. Um, we see some malignant diffuse uh, glioma cases uh, which have been treated, um, but uh, uh, but also other glioma types like, for example, PXAs uh, and and also others. Looking at the efficacy results, um, it's a kind of a busy slide. I will take you uh, through it. We can see here on the left, in this left panel, these are the PXA cases that uh, some of them responded quite well to this, uh, to this uh, BRAF inhibitor therapy, while uh, glioblastomas and anaplastic astrocytomas shown in the middle um, didn't show uh, that favorable responses uh, with uh, mainly uh, disease stabilizations uh, and only one partial response in this uh, uh, small uh, uh, patient sample set. And here among the, the other uh, tumor types like anaplastic angliomas and phagocytic uh, astrocytomas, uh, some responses were seen. So if we look specifically at the group of uh, glioblastoma patients, the results are um, um, underwhelming, I would say. So um, I think we would have hoped for for, for uh, better treatments. And also, if you look at the SWIM plots, you can see that the PXAs seem to do better on this treatment than uh, glioblastomas. Um, the toxicity profile we know from the melanoma field, so no, no new neurological uh, complications uh, came up here. Um, there are some atralgias and some uh, skin adverse effects and some, some fever and rash that, that uh, we, we know uh, already it's a quite well tolerated uh, treatment. The question is whether concurrent treatment with a MEK inhibitor, which uh, increases um, the efficacy in uh, melanomas, for example, is also uh, useful in uh, glioma cases. Um, here we are still lacking uh, uh, data from, from, from controlled clinical trials, but at least some case reports, patient series, uh, do show uh, that uh, that intracranial responses with this combination uh, can be achieved, <clears throat> and again, uh, tolerab tolerability is uh, is uh, quite favorable. So that's something to look out for, and that can be uh, considered also in the clinical setting if you come across a patient uh, with a disappear of mutation. Uh, but of course, the question is: Do this rare mutation um, argue for for routine testing for this uh, alteration in, in everyday clinical setting. Another alteration, uh, an interesting one I want to highlight is uh, the NTREC uh, translocation. There are, there are different uh, types of this aberration. There are three uh, NTREC receptors which uh, activate uh, MAP kinase, uh, PS3 kinase uh, pathways and uh, lead to survival and uh, proliferation, differentiation uh, signaling. And uh, the, although these are rare uh, um, uh, aberrations, again, in glioma's effective drugs 
are available. Um, these uh, aberrations are found in, in various kinds of tumors, in some sarcomas, in some, some rare breast cancers, in some thyroid cancers, uh, and several others. And uh, some uh, companies have developed specific inhibitors of this, uh, of this uh, translocation. Um, there are uh, fusions. So there are different fusions um, that, that can be found um, of, the, of the three entric uh, genes with different uh, partner genes. You can, you can uh, find a list here and uh, you can also see in this, uh, in this column which is, says a frequency that the frequency again is unfortunately very low in gliomas. Um, only very few cases uh, harbor these uh, fusions. Um, uh, if you look at the characteristics of these tumors, you can see that um, different types of diffuse uh, gliomas um, can, uh, can, 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 um, can carry this uh, alteration. Some emerging data show that uh, also in intracranial tumors, like for example um, brain metastasis of entric fusion positive solid tumors, um, uh, entric inhibition can be effective with entrectinib, for example. That's one of, of the drugs that, that are available. This was uh, presented uh, at last year's um, uh, ESMO conference with, with intracranial uh, uh, response rates of about uh, 60%, including some complete and uh, partial responses. So that's, that's good news. That, that means that these drugs uh, get uh, into, the, into, the, uh, into the brain, across the blood-brain barrier in sufficient amounts in, in principle. But what does that mean for gliomas? Here we lack um, um, data so far. There are some reports, some case reports, again, uh, emerging small uh, uh, case series, which show that um, uh, entric inhibition uh, can induce responses not only in brain metastasis, but also in uh, in primary brain tumors, uh, as shown in, in this case report here. However, we're still looking for controlled uh, or prospective uh, clinical trials. There are some, some ongoing ones like, uh, like this one. In the EOTC brain tumor group, we also uh, tried to organize one. We even have a, um, a trial number because we went through all the scientific review process and uh, we're also, also um, quite advanced in, uh, in uh, discussions with the company a sponsor. However, so far we didn't uh, get this project off the ground. Unfortunately, we wanted to include here 55 patients in a two-stage uh, design with uh, gliomas recurrent uh, gliomas <clears throat> harboring entric uh, or was one uh, alterations. Uh, one of the challenges is for such a project that you need high numbers of patients that you screen, so about 3,000 patients or so for, for would, uh, would have been needed um, to, to accrue into this trial um, and we're still looking to find uh, support uh, for this study and hopefully uh, we, can, we can manage to do so. So in conclusion, pharmacotherapy for recurrent glioblastoma is not well defined. Um, we all know that from our daily clinical setting, there are unfortunately no established predictive molecular markers for glioblastoma. MGMT testing uh, is, uh, not, uh, is not a predictive mar marker at this point. However, we, we really lack uh, data, uh, clear data on, on this topic. And molecular profiling may be considered to, to detect some rare targetable molecular alterations. Uh, we saw before in the poll that about 50% or so of us um, um, uh, think it, it may be useful. Um, I must say at my institution we don't do it on a, on a regular or on a routine basis at least. We do it sometimes in, in specific uh, cases where um, we have a fresh tissue and, and look for some alterations, but it's not a, kind of not a reflex testing that is run uh, on every patient. With that, uh, I thank you for attention. I want to point out that this year's uh, EANO conference will be held virtually. It was planned for Rotterdam uh, initially. Uh, Rotterdam will happen, but it will happen in two years from now. But EANO um, 2021 uh, will take place on September 25th and 26th. Uh, you can register yourself. Uh, abstract deadline um, has already closed and we have received a number of, uh, of abstracts, uh, high quality uh, abstracts and, and the late abstract um, um, opportunity uh, is still open. So I, I invite you to, 
to submit any any uh, and any abstracts uh, you may have there. And I hope to see you at this virtual conference. And I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, I don't know if there are some questions. Maybe uh, I have uh, some question uh, on uh, vaccination. So I'm going to read you some questions. So. Uh, what about dendritic cell vaccination for glioblastoma recurrent treatment? Um, so, um, dendritic uh, dendritic vaccinations um, have not uh, been have not proven uh, if effective so far. Um, for one of the trials, we're still waiting for the final uh, report. Only an um, only a preliminary uh, paper has been published there. But I'm not aware of 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 of, of any positive trials on on dendritic cell uh, vaccinations, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, maybe uh, yes, another question: How do you treat uh, midline gliomas, uh, H3 uh, K27 mutants in adults or young adults? Uh, do you use uh, vorinostat or some other specific treatment? Um, no, we don't, um, uh, and I'm happy to hear other opinions on that. I feel uh, that uh, the data we have on the topic are not um, are not fit to to guide uh, clinical practice at this point in time. Um, so we will use uh, radio chemotherapy as for for any glioma. A question, uh, Matthias. In your practice, do you sometimes? Uh, uh, um, for a recurrent glioblastoma, do you propose a new STUP protocol? Sorry, I didn't get it. Do you do you propose sometimes for your patient with recurrent glioblastoma uh, uh, a new tube protocol, ray radiation with te temozolomide? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, so we oftentimes uh, combine radiotherapy with uh, chemotherapy also in the recurrent setting. Yes. Okay. Elizabeth. Uh, yes. Elizabeth, this is Michael. Um, apparently. There are questions in the chat, but I cannot see them in the questions. So maybe Matthias or you could try to look into the questions. My screen is blocked. I just know there are questions. Uh, I don't I, I'm yeah. trying to. Uh, Elizabeth can see them in the questions pane. Matthias will not be able to see them. I'm going to try. Uh, uh, I, I just see one from Giuseppe Miniti, I guess, uh, about lomastin plus radiation and recurrent, which is a bit similar to the question, I guess, Elizabeth, on timozolomide yeah. and, and radiation. I guess, again, no, da no data, but something that's worth testing, maybe. But apparently there are other questions, Elizabeth. I hope you can fix it. I can't. Michael, what is your opinion on MGMT testing or the data from the director trial on, on MGMT? I think it's exactly as you said. So we never test, we never retest. We rely on the result from the primary tumor. And I also agree that um, the the if you are somebody who believes that MGMT is simply prognostic, then the director trial can also interpret it this way, right? Because we didn't have a timozolomide-free control arm. Um, I think the the trials really that give us a bit of information is the AVAREC that you cited and of course the Rego trial from Italy where where there was not a very clear surprisingly not a clear signal for MGMT being more more prognostic in in the control arm yeah uh yeah they asked some question I don't know a lot of question uh CCNU versus ray radiation for recurrence any preference uh, you want to answer, Matthias? The preference would be to do a clinical trial to, 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 to address these questions. Otherwise, we are in a kind of an evidence-free zone and it needs to be adapted uh, to each patient, you know, uh, to, to, to see what would be the radiation field, what are the, the prior treatments of the patients, uh, what are, what, so uh, look at different yeah. arguments. But in the end, it will be a case-by-case -case discussion and uh, and decision that is not really based on on clear scientific data. So to me, it's very astonishing that in recurrent glioblastoma we lack well-performed trials for large parts on very simple questions. Yeah, we need uh, to develop more clinical trials. Yes. Yeah. 
You're right. Another question. Uh, do you think CDK uh, and uh, 2A could be a valuable target? Um, well, any 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 uh, molecular alteration that is um, recurrently found is attractive as a potential target. Um, however, um, for this alteration, we don't have specific drugs. The question whether CDK inhibitors um, are yeah. useful for, for, for these patients is unresolved. In breast cancer, um, CDK and uh, 2A alterations are, are not predictive. In, in glioma, we, again, we lack uh, the data. Uh, but there are, there are some groups who work on that, both in preclinical um, preclinical um, investigations, but also in, 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 in clinical studies, for example, end to end to uh, study in, in Heidelberg. Um, so potentially, yes. Um, although I'm, I'm a little bit skeptic from the, from the information that I have seen that this will be a strong predictive marker for CDK inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe another question. Uh, should uh, be look for, uh, do we have to look for microsatellite stability in post mesolomide tissue? Um, so I think this uh, taps into the question of immunotherapy markers, um, also um, a tumor mutational burden. Uh, immunotherapy in, in non-selected patients, um, unfortunately, was uh, not an, an effective treatment so far in, 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 in glioblastoma, and we have some, some, some well-performed trials there, both in recurrent and in, in the newly diagnosed setting. There are some reports which show that the specific types of gliomas do respond to immunotherapy. For example, when there's a high mutational burden in the context of, of, of some rare familial uh, syndromes. However, there are also uh, data showing that high mutational burdens do not predict um, a response to immunotherapy outside of these, uh, of these uh, familial syndromes. Um, so an unresolved question, there, there are gliomas that respond to immunotherapy, but um, it's, uh, we don't know which for sure, or we don't know even the marker to use to, 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 to define those. Um, again, I think it calls for well-performed investigations on molecularly enriched recurrent glioblastoma patients. Again, very challenging because these are only rare uh, cases. Okay, I don't know if uh, we have time again for some question. Michael, do you have some question? No, and I also guess we have no time. <laughs> okay, so we have to close the session and uh, first uh, to thank everybody for the presentation uh, and also all the, the questions that have been asked, uh, and also uh, to uh, to speak about the next uh, ENO webinar. So the next one it will be in uh, June 30 on uh, metabolic vulnerabilities in brain tumor colonization. And also in on uh, advance, uh, we are speaking about immunotherapy. So an advance in the immunotherapy for gliomas uh, in July, end of July on the 28th. And of course, uh, don't miss the ENO meeting. <laughs> in September. So thank you very much for to everybody. And uh, I think that we can close the session. Michael? Yeah, I think so, unless the president has a final word. <laughs> yes. Well, thank but you. Yes. Thank you all for thank you all for participating and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a